And so moving forward, we have one more agenda item before Committee of the Whole this afternoon, which is a City Hall encampment discussion that's going to be led by Mayor Fleetwood. Thank you, Council. We have with us today, well, a lot of staff is here, but the idea today was uh, for me just to lay down some introductory remarks, comments about um, the last nearly three months now. We've also got Eric Johnston here from Public Works and uh, Bellingham Police Chief Flo Simon. And we're here to uh, just give some descriptions on uh, the, uh, the disencampment operation that happened on January 28th and uh, answer questions. And if council's wanting to have a broader conversation about um, housing and emergency shelter, we can take uh, questions up in that regard. But the agenda item is um, city hall encampment discussion. So I'll just lay down some remarks and, um, and then hand it over probably to uh, uh, Flo and, and then to Eric. So just as an introduction, of course, people realize, remember, recall that a, a tent encampment began on a lawn in front of City Hall in uh, mid-November. Uh, it came to my attention um, on Veterans Day, November 11th. And of course, it later expanded to the north lawn of the Central Library. Um, it quickly emerged, and we were told that it was a it was a uh, organized protest, and it evolved from there. Many people who were living unsheltered were staying at the encampment, aided by a group working as a um, collective that organized volunteers and. Um, donations and assisted campers with food and other things and to bring attention to the needs of those who are um, unsheltered. Uh, you recall at that time in November, uh, base camp was filled up. Um, I remember one night around mid-November that I think they were at 196. And so the posture that we took um, was that uh, we were acknowledging the need to increase uh, emergency sheltering and that we were going to go about building um, conditions to create additional sheltering uh, in our community. Of course, when the encampment happened, that large number of folks at base camp uh, shrunk and uh, there was a corresponding increase at, at City Hall. Fast forward. Um, January 28th, 2021, that was the culmination of uh, a public uh, declaration that I had made about a month before, at the end of December, after working with a number of folks to try and uh, see if we could um, make an offer um, from some portion of the folks that were part of the collective to serve as an operator. We formed a formed a, um, an offer to them that included a site and 25 tiny homes from the, the county, a site that was offered by the, uh, the port. The city had offered reasonable conditions and, um, and money for credentialed professionals. Uh, that offer was, was rejected, as people know. Um, and after putting in some considerable due diligence, um, over a number of weeks um, uh, for a variety of reasons, but primarily around uh, health and safety for everyone. Uh, I announced that the shelter was going to come to an end in the month of January, by the end of January. So uh, as everyone knows now, January 28th, an action was taken to end the encampment. We're here today primarily to just give an overview of those actions. Uh, we understand the impact of ending the encampment is deeply felt in our community, generating a wide variety uh, and range of, of reactions. Uh, the situation at City Hall, as I've said previously, it was complex, uh, challenging, dynamic. Uh, 
the increasingly, as time went by, urgent circumstances created by the encampment at City Hall uh, should also be viewed in the larger context of the city's continuous work, along with Whatcom County and other uh, partners on both short-term uh, and longer-term solutions to providing safe shelter for those experiencing homelessness. Uh, contrary to many of the assertions that we've heard, uh, that we are, quote, doing nothing, um, it was, of course, wrong. Uh, our local governments are doing more than, than ever before, and uh, we we're fortunate to hear from Ann Deacon at the Health Department give her presentation just uh, an hour, hour and a half ago. Uh, the city, as was stated, spends um, over $5 million per year on contracts with partners who provide services to help either prevent or respond to homelessness. The Whatcom County Health Department contributes an equivalent amount of money. Um, there's over $10 million per year countywide that are spent in this community. And also, contrary to claims, we remain actively engaged in increasing um, sheltering options. And we've said before, we're, we're engaged with multiple partners and advocates for those living unsheltered. Over the last three months, I have put considerable energy uh, into this effort, as, as has my staff and a number of partners, and we're still active in that today. Um, I think it's well known to you, the, the Homes Now site at Swift Haven that we've put up. Um, we've announced publicly the RFQ with um, uh, Lehigh uh, in partnership with Road to Home that's going to be coming up with uh, potential for an additional 40 or so sites and we continue to take seriously the question of um, putting up and working, continuing the work of putting up uh, additional sites. So the action taken by the city on January 28th was the culmination of work undertaken by me and numerous members of the department head team. Uh, what had begun as a protest to highlight the needs of the unsheltered uh, in our community blossomed into an uncontrolled and dangerous no barrier encampment, despite our many weeks of negotiations and offers uh, of our time, property, financial support, and additional tiny homes. This was a particularly challenging and discouraging negotiation because uh, all of us agree that nobody should be left behind. And um, pleased to say that we're taking affirmative steps in our community towards ending that. However, we also recognize that they have to be supervised sites and they have to be safe shelters for the reasons that were offered by Ann Deacon today. We've consistently acknowledged that local government need to increase uh, wintering sheltering capacity, and we're making diligent, solid progress in, in that effort. In the meantime, it has been the city's practice for many years to not tolerate encampments on public property and instead to encourage those who are unsheltered to use existing services. In fact, as we know, there's a municipal code uh, that prohibits overnight camping in, um, in our parks. Uh, over the course of my negotiations with the organizers, it became clear, clear that their demands could not be uh, met. Their ask was too big. At one point, it was 50 tiny homes. Uh, that was actually something that we worked towards and continue to work towards, and I think we'll have that. Um, we'll have that soon. But it grew, it changed. At one point it was 100. Um, so we, we had to take action. Um, one of the claims that was consistently made is that uh, we needed a site for every single person on the lawn. That was a difficult target, especially in light of the science that we have, which is that there's some significant number, percentage of folks that uh, will not go into any kind of structured arrangement. So we felt that the um, proposal that was made with some of the advocates with whom we were engaged was, um, for that reason, unreasonable, and it never gave us an identified amount. Um, it's also the case that many of the unsheltered are well known to city staff and service providers, and uh, we know and they know uh, the solutions that uh, many of those individuals 
needed. So it, that's one more problem. I think you've heard um, from us that many of the service providers felt that it was unwelcome and unsafe and they couldn't get in there and do the work that was required. Uh, so uh, those were some of the reasons for why we um, additionally felt that it was necessary for this to come to an end. Uh, in some ways, this is a choice, uh, but moreover, it's often the result of years of trauma-informed experience that can be exacer exacerbated by behavioral health and or substance abuse problems amongst the campers themselves. Compounding problems at the encampment at City Hall was that our service providers, as I said, felt threatened and often harassed by the organizers of the encampment, and so they weren't feeling inclined to come down to it. Um, there were assertions made that no one helped, uh, that's not true. Uh, the service providers came down early on to assist in the in the encampment when it started. Health department conducted considerable COVID-19 tested testing at the site and related outreach on um, on site for for several weeks. As time went on, uh, most service providers felt increasingly threatened and chose for their own personal safety to not enter the encampment. And this included emergency medical providers, law enforcement personnel. Uh, and human service workers. So these circumstances further highlighted the need to uh, disband the encampment. Uh, we remain confident that the decision we made, that our response uh, was necessary to protect the safety of everyone involved. City staff exhibited a tremendous amount of restraint and compassion, disbanding, um, disbanding the camp. Bellingham Police were there to ensure uh, camper and city staff safety. Bellingham Public Works was there to assist campers and volunteers in removing their belongings and to clean up uh, on the lawn after they left. Protesters who arrived well after the effort began were insistent on creating a disturbance and provoking uh, violence. I'm thankful for the restraint shown by our officers and I'm thankful there were no serious injuries during that um, operation. It's worth noting that many, if not all, of the 35 campers, that's what we counted on the uh, day that the encampment ended, uh, complied peacefully uh, with the request to disband the encamp. Uh, that cannot be said of the late arriving protesters. There are a variety of rumors, half-truths, and flat-out lies and assertions surrounding the encampment and its dispersal. In today's uh, contemporary political discourse and in the era of social media, it's impossible to correct every statement. It's important to remember that that's one of the conditions that existed uh, uh, this year with all of the crises we've experienced, social media. Um, so as I said, it's impossible to correct every statement. Uh, nor, I think, should we uh, redirect limited resources away from our response to try to do so beyond providing timely, accurate information using our, our own sites. And I'm happy that we've put up a lot of information to correct things at um, cob.org encampment, a lot of links to information there. With that in mind, however, I want to correct the record on what has been said falsely about the encampment removal. Uh, it's been suggested by some, although I don't believe by most, that perhaps it was some kind of a ruse. Um, that's absolutely not the case. Uh, we gave notice of our intention asking people to leave by um, Friday the 29th and a couple days before the deadline, um, we received credible information that there was an effort afoot to um, call people to action and come to Bellingham. So we had every intention of having a deliberate safe removal from that site on Friday. And we hoped that that would be the case. But those plans were altered uh, only after widespread calls were made by Bellingham Occupied Protest and others for out of town protesters to come to Bellingham. The intellig intelligence we had indicated that that response would be large and potentially violent. So we did what we did and made the decision. And I'm absolutely confident it was the right decision. Um, 
a lot of people have asked questions about Border Patrol, and, and Flo can talk to that um, more. The uh, our mutual aid partner, Whatcom County Sheriff, was um, was originally on site to, as I understand, protect the, the county courthouse and to assist with protesters and offer support for uh, Bellingham Police. Again, Flo can get into that detail more. Um, the Whatcom County Sheriff um, requested mutual aid from, from the Border Patrol. Uh, why the presence of so many law enforcement personnel? Again, I can let uh, Flo speak to the details and more, but measures of precaution uh, will always be taken when we're faced with information about direct threats. I think the community expect, expects that. We've all seen protests quickly change from peaceful and manageable to violent, especially in recent months, uh, when extremist groups intermingle with local protesters. No one wanted a uh, heavy law enforcement presence to be necessary to end the encampment. In fact, we recall um, the remarks that Flo made at the press conference on that day when one of the reporters from Seattle uh, asked what would have been necessary but for the protesters. And I think Flo said, you know, just a few. Um, so, but the lawlessness and the public safety threat made this unavoidable. Um, I cannot agree that law enforcement should have somehow shown up less prepared or in fewer numbers in our effort to protect the campers, our employees, and the public. Um, why didn't you tell the council? Some people have asked. I think you all understand why we did that. Obviously, it needed to be um, on the down low to maintain the, the element of surprise. And so uh, it was a decision, as I recall, we made on Tuesday. And we could have gone in on Wednesday or Thursday, but made the decision to do it on on Thursday. Uh, why did the law enforcement presence continue into the weekend? Uh, the response appeared to counsel and the public to end Thursday afternoon when uh, Bellingham Police and Public Works left City Hall. Uh, there were a number of um, assertions made that um, that's uh, questioned why we had continued to have police presence over the weekend. They were remaining on alert um, throughout that weekend because we continued to receive intelligence about possible violent disruptors coming to Bellingham and a continuation of things. So this is why a, a visible um, increased law enforcement presence remained in the Civic Center, including um, rooftop surveillance. We do have a SWAT team. They do go when something like this, when there's a potential threat and they go up on the highest perch. Um, the initial claims that obviously generated an emotional reaction that were false were that there were people up there with long guns pointed at campers. Nothing could be further from the truth. There were no guns pointed at anybody, but there were people on the roof. Uh, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Flo. Uh, and and Eric can go after that just to provide a, their high level observations about the nature of the operation and anything else that they want to add. So Flo, take it away. Thank you, Mayor. Good afternoon, Council. Thank you for having us today and uh, listening to our overview of uh, the camp cleanup that occurred on January 28th. Um, after having been in talks with the mayor and city staff for since the encampment started in November, it was clear that the camp was escalating in its violence and also its um, risk to public safety as, as city and county employees had been harassed, um, one had already been assaulted. And when the city tried to impose the 25 foot barrier against the building on January 22nd, we got a pretty good flavor of what was to come if we were going to do a camp cleanup with um, people chasing the public works crew, trying to take the signs down, throwing rocks through City Hall, and ending with the, um, the, the hatchet assault that, that night of a gentleman. So it was posted to clean the camp on the 29th. Um, and as soon as it was posted, we began receiving credible information of a call for people to show up to Bellingham, show up Friday and plan to stay for several days. Uh, and they referenced Cal Anderson in Seattle and the call went from here to Belling or to Seattle to Portland and they were expecting large numbers. 
and fearing for everybody's safety and knowing that we would all be quickly outnumbered if that happened, we decided to clean the camp a day early. Um, we had the fortified wall that was there against City Hall that was made up of pallets, and behind that was a a cage that only a couple of people entered, and uh, we feared that that was their their armory and they had stored helmets and, and protective equipment there. So on the 28th, the plan was made to go early in the morning and start the cleanup when people were still asleep and protesters weren't arriving. Uh, we did that. We secured the um, the wall there and started clearing the camp as soon as we. As soon as we stepped onto the lawn at City Hall, the calls went out for protesters to start showing up, and they started showing up in, in large numbers. Um, I had 50 officers on site, and it became pretty evident pretty, pretty quickly that we were going to need more um, personnel. So I requested mutual aid from the Whatcom County Sheriff's Office, who was securing the courthouse to make sure that uh, nothing got um, vandalized there or people didn't get their safety was intact so i made the call for mutual aid with uh, the sheriff's office as well as the washington state patrol who had to travel from uh south to get here so it was going to take them about an hour and a half to get here uh, and meantime the police department held the skirmish line with the protesters who as you've seen in the video uh, they were spit on they were assaulted uh, and they did that for eight hours um Meanwhile, the campers who were at City Hall, who were very peaceful, who were very polite, who were thankful that we were there, um, keeping the safety there, cleaned up their camp, moved their belongings, and some of them moved to um, Frank Jerry Fields. Uh, some of them, I don't know where they went, but um, once they were done clearing the camp, the protesters um, left the area and Public Works was then able to safely come in and, and clean up the rest of City Hall. Um, some of the questions that I get are why was the SWAT team used? Um, the SWAT team is specially trained to deal with um, uh, weapons that may be present during a scene and also to, to provide oversight for a situation. The reason they were on the roof is because of the, the information um, of people being armed and they were relaying information to, to the officers on the ground of what they were seeing and, and who might be a threat to, to officers and to the public works crew and also to the campers. Um, so I think that's the, the brief overview I'll give. I'll let Eric go and I'm sure you have some questions. Uh, I'll just be very, very brief just to echo what the mayor and, and Chief Simon had talked about. The, the, the intent was, uh, uh, there was no ruse, I will say that, that was personally down there on Tuesday morning uh, to post those signs with every intent of having that ending by Friday. And by Tuesday afternoon, found myself in a meeting with the chief and some other folks assessing the intelligence that the dynamic was changing rapidly. Um, as the mayor mentioned, we are in the business of protecting the public safety of all not just of campers, but of all members of the public. And the decision was made not lightly to proceed in the fashion that we proceeded. Uh, I'd just like to say that I'm very proud of the public works staff for the way that they acted. And I'm grateful for the support of the public works, of the police department and the way that they conducted themselves. Uh, it was disappointing not to be able to help the campers as we had intended to be helping. Instruction was given to public works staff the morning of that our role was to assist and to help and to provide assistance where we possibly could. And in many cases, we're prohibited from doing so. We were not allowed to do the things that we were directing to our staff to do, which was to help the campers move to a different location. And in many cases, that resulted in uh, a rather unfortunate set of circumstances for some campers. My personal experience at the camp was that the campers themselves, and by and large part, were uh, uh, worked well with us. But in many cases, we were impeded in our efforts to help by folks who were not camping, but by folks from the outside. Eric, some of the early claims that went out and inflamed the passions of people, uh, again, the delights of social media, um, were that um, bulldozers were just bulldozing across the lawn and um, bulldozing property. Could, could you address the, 
the whole bulldozers claim? I certainly can, and 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 to not to be too specific, but we did not bring a bulldozer. We did bring some 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 heavy equipment, uh, excavators and loaders, which were intended to move material from ground level up into the large dumpsters. And so, when property when when material that was on that site was deemed not to be personal property by by staff who have that training and expertise in accordance with city policy, that the material was pulled off by hand onto the sidewalk or onto the city street and was either loaded into the, the scoops of the, of the loaders and placed into the dumpsters, but we did not bring bulldozers. We did not bring heavy equipment onto the lawn. Uh, a particular note, there was great concern for the trees around city hall. And so instruction was given to staff not to bring equipment onto that lawn to preserve and, and protect those trees. So if the heavy equipment that was on site was used uh, when the material was placed by hand into those loaders to place it from the machine into the 40 yard dumpster, but we did not bulldoze tents. We did not bulldoze personal property. There was, there was a review by on-site staff trained in that particular area to identify what property needed to be preserved and what items would be considered uh, needed to be disposed of, but we did not have bulldozers. We did not run down uh, anyone's uh, particular tent site. What, one more thing to add to that. We, uh, Parks and Public Works staff have for many years been involved in cleanups of uh, uh, encampment sites throughout the city, along our critical areas, along the waterways or in parks. Uh, and as a general rule, we try hard not to have staff uh, touching material. Uh, in many cases, there are known threats from needles or other byproducts of, of, of drug use, unfortunately. Um, there are unsanitary conditions in many of these campsites. And so generally speaking, we try very hard not to use, you know, not to come in direct contact with that material out of uh, uh, concern for safety for staff for doing that. Uh, so that means we do use some occasionally some equipment to avoid the person people uh, directly coming in contact with that material. Uh, there's also been a concern that the area around City Hall as a result of that kind of contamination is now considered a biohazard. And I want to assure folks that it's not a biohazard, that, that we have done a really rather thorough job of, of cleaning up that site and Parks is now involved in a further action to restore that to, to be used by the public. Uh, but it's not considered a biohazard, but we do take precautions in in cleaning up uh, solid waste, not just solid waste from encampment sites, but also from the litter that people illegally dump in the woods. And so it's generally speaking, we try not to touch it with our hands. We just deal with machines or uh, or other types of equipment. Mayor Fleetwood, did you want to handle, accept questions at this time or did you have anything further? Sure, Council Member Hamill. <clears throat> um, I'm wondering about campers' uh, possessions, uh, things that, you know, are gonna, tents or sleeping bags or equipment that would, that they would use to live. If, uh, were, they, were those items taken away or, and if they were, are they uh, retrie retrievable by the, by the campers. Yes, yeah, so uh, the campers were told to take the property that they wanted with them and whatever they couldn't take, we would um, impound. And I can tell you that we have one tent and a lot of personal property and Public Works did a great job of picking up an entire area and putting it in a bin. And then um, Claudia and Sergeant Layton spent the next three days putting stuff in clear bags so that it was easily identifiable. And mind you, most of this stuff is wet. And so, um, you know, if it stays in the container too long, it's gonna, it's gonna be um, moldy. But in talking to some of the people from the camp, uh, they don't wanna come get their stuff if they're just gonna have to be moved from Frank Jerry. So they're, most of them are gonna leave their stuff probably in the container that is here at the police department. Um, we've told campers to call and make an appointment and Claudia will, do her best to, to get them to identify their, their items. Can you elaborate a little, Flo, on the process by which we've uh, established for who you call, 
um, where people would find reference to who they call? Yeah, so uh, critical of that. Right. So the the um, notices that they all have Claudia Viscara's number on them, um, and also we posted it on the the website who to call, and uh, make an appointment with her to come to come and retrieve their items during business hours. And Claudia is um, familiar with most of the people that were at the encampment there at City Hall. They all know her, um, but as of today, none of them have come in to get their stuff. If I might add to that as well, that we were prepared as a city to to store a significant amount of personal belongings. Uh, and in many cases, unfortunately, we're not able to do that because we were impaired by the protesters and not able to engage with the campers themselves. But we did have staff on site who were in a position to following city policy for for personal belongings to identify those personal belongings and as Flo mentioned to secure them for later recovery by staff. Uh, instructions for how to recover that property was posted by the Bellingham Police Department on their Facebook page. And those instructions were also distributed to many of the service providers in our community who work with homeless population on a regular basis. Yeah, and the campers uh, themselves put uh, made piles of what they wanted discarded. And uh, um, so Public Works was able to know that that is definitely going as refuse, but the, the rest of the stuff is here at the station and has been cataloged. And, and that is also consistent with how we have approached uh, camps historically following city process, right? So when a camp had been identified in a park or under a bridge someplace, uh, there is clear direction, clear policy that we follow as to what is a personal belonging, what would be considered waste, if it's soiled or uh, you know, and otherwise not salvageable material. Uh, we typically don't keep those products, but uh, personal identification was one we keep and impound and allow to be retrieved. Um, clothing that is soiled or foul would not be kept. Pinky. Uh, yes, and thank you so much for this report. Um, I'm wondering if uh, Chief Simon, if you could address something that is being an untruth I believe that is being perpetuated on social media right now. I wasn't there on site, so I don't have firsthand, but I do have um, a number of people who were in the vicinity and watching. And so I have their account, but I wasn't there. And one of the things that I've heard is that it was a violent removal. And to my knowledge that all the campers were um, that there were no issues with the campers, that, that it was only the protesters who were trying to incite BPD uh, and staging scenes in attempts to escalate things. And that's where the issues were, but not, there were no issues with the campers. Is that, could you elaborate on that, please? You, you hit the nail on the head there, Council Member Vargas. Um, the, the campers themselves were never on the skirmish line. They were never um, part of the group that was agitated. Um, the protesters were trying to get the officers to uh, to arrest them, to, you know, to take them down and do all that stuff. And I, I've got to say uh, what an amazing job the men and women did that day on not falling for that and, and, and being able to de-escalate and keep themselves calm. Um, yeah, it, that never happened. The, the 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 aggression was from the agitators towards the police department, and it was never the campers that 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 were aggressors. If if I may, I will say that all the people who were watching, business owners, people all in the vicinity who've had their eyes on this for months, said that they thought the BPD did an extraordinary job of keeping themselves calm, trying to um, de-escalate as much as they could, um, but that it was, as uh, Eric Johnson said, very difficult to help because uh, of the protesters. But I, I just want to say that um, I think I'm very, I, I want to send my appreciation uh, to the BPD for a very difficult situation and for handling this very respectfully. So thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Holly. Thank you for this really thorough discussion. I actually 
ticked off just about every question I had written down already. So um, nice work. Um, but I, one that I have seen repeated by quite a few people is questioning the legality of what happened that day. Can, are we, can we address that at all? I think that the legality should, we'll, we'll defer to executive session for that. That would be my request, just jumping in here and not being called on, but um, we, we'll have ample time to discuss that in, in, in an executive session. I'm sorry, is there anything, Mr. Fado, that would be appropriate to say in open session? Um, I can assure you that we followed uh, the guidance of case law with respect to um, the operation on that day, given the totality of circumstances, um, that's that's basically what it comes down to from the legal perspective. Gene? Yes, um, I just wanna say to you, Mayor Fleetwood, and everybody who was involved in this, I think you saved us from a lot of violence. I think you saved us from possibly somebody getting seriously hurt. It's never popular when you have to make a tough decision like that. You know, it's, it's tough. But our community that day went through something that was uh, eye-dropping to me. I never thought I would live long enough to see people spitting on law enforcement, throwing things at them. Because I can tell you this, growing up, if that would have happened here years ago, there would have been a different outcome. So to the law enforcement, to Flo and everybody who was involved in that, to see those officers endure that was, uh, I never, never thought I'd see something like that. But I know it's tough on everybody. This community is going through a lot now, but on that day, it had to be done. There was no choice but to get it done. And uh, I just wanna say to you, thank you for your leadership. This was something that, uh, like I've said, Ever since you've been mayor, you've been dealt more bad hands than a good poker player ever would have received. So thank you for uh, keeping our city safe. Thank you for that, Gene. Michael. Well, I've got a kind of, a ton of kind of comments and kind of framing statements I'd like to make. And I think I'm gonna avoid that for the moment, maybe come back to it if you're not nice to me. If you're not nice to me, I'm going to say them anyway. But I do want to raise one particular issue that's been raised over and over again, which is CDC guidelines and basically common sense that during a time of pandemic, um, if people were camped out in the woods or at a shelter, maybe the best thing to do uh, is to leave them alone the same way that I have really reduced where I go and what I do and who I see. We should allow campers, people who are homeless and have found some impromptu, maybe technically illegal place to live to also stay in place and limit their contacts and not move around. So a lot of people have suggested, and there's good sense behind it, that as a rule, we should leave campers where they are. My understanding is that as a rule, we have been leaving campers where they are. I'm wondering how the COVID consideration factored into this one particular camp. I think you need to look at the, uh, the CDC guidelines. They, they suggested that if there was a pre-existing camp, that perhaps moving them would put them in greater danger. If you've got a camp and it's social distancing is, is happening, uh, then obviously that's a safer circumstance than going into a different dynamic where they can't do social distancing. Let us observe that there was all sorts of violations of social distancing at Camp 210. There's also an assertion that CDC guidelines um, of an existing camp, a pre-existing camp that had been around some time, is that it would uh, uh, create awareness to the social workers and they'd be able to access. Let's remember that at Camp 210, it was precisely the opposite. Social workers that would go in and usually engage felt, as they said it, to use their words, unsafe and unwelcome. So I think if people are going to cite CDC guidelines, they should at least do it in a logical way. Peter? Yeah, I would just add to that that um, if you look at the full extent of the CDC guidelines, it's not nearly as simple as uh, leave all camps where they are. There's a lot of interest in 
the maintenance of services and protocols and what we've heard in the in the discussion today in these committees in these committee meetings is that this encampment was anything but what, what is described in those CDC guidelines for how to go about uh, ensuring safety with respect to protocol, especially as compared to some of the al other alternatives that are out there here now. Lisa. Thank you. It's more of a comment. I just also wanted to share my appreciation to the public work staff, the Parks Department staff, our EMS services, and our law enforcement. Um, for the folks that I've spoken with, nobody, nobody wants to be put in that position, but they all understood um, what was at hand. Um, I also saw a lot of the social media posts spreading around and had communicated my concern about the escalation on Friday and um, primarily a, a big concern about especially the, the homeless or the houseless that were living there, um, the impact on them. Um, so, and I, I know we have no perfect solutions and uh, I think we're trying to work through as many possibilities for increasing our services. So. Um, I, as Jean has said, Seth, you've kind of had quite the year. Um, we were all hoping 2021 with, you know, like, unfortunately we can't tear the page and everything's better by now, but um, I just wanted to, you know, say thank you. I think there was a very measured, um, careful, approach to what happened on Thursday. And for those who felt that it was really overkill, um, it's never good to um, go in unprepared. And given a lot of the um, social media posts and the response, um, we basically, I felt like we really avoided a riot um, that could have happened on Friday and the damage and destruction that would come from that and the possibility of personal harm. So um, I think it was the right decision. It was an unfortunate decision and I don't think anyone really is happy we were in that position, but I think staff did a very commendable job and it was a very difficult um, situation to be put in. And for me, as far as being a council member, not being on the inside track of that information, I completely understand that because we don't run the day-to-day -day operations of the city where we really are the legislative branch. And so some of those decisions, um, I think we become involved and communicated to at an appropriate time. So I just wanted to say that I, I understand that and I respect that. So thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Hannah? Yeah, so um, in light of time, and then also my question sort of, I think is beyond the scope of this particular agenda bill, which was focused on the encampment and the events on the 28th, which I greatly appreciate. Um, and thank you to Chief Simon and Director Johnson for your time coming forward and presenting that information. But my questions, um, I guess about where we go, right? And my concerns about the sanitary um, or lack of sanitary conditions and unsafe conditions at Jerry Field and really concern for those who are unsheltered um, and how we as a community regain access to, I mean, them just to assess those needs and what the next steps are going forward. And so I'm just curious if and when there will be an opportunity for that, um, that discussion perhaps. Yeah, well, that's that's a really uh, important conversation. You know, the 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 position we've taken in recent months, and I've perceived support for this to some extent. And I say I'll qualify why I say some extent, um, but this notion that uh, we acknowledged a need for some increase shelter when there was that time in November when we perceived base camp filling up. And we said, um, we're going to acknowledge the need for an increase in that. That is um, for temporary emergency shelter. Um, the, the question of how far we go along that in line with uh, Ann Deacon's comments about um, the primary object of housing first, which is creating permanent housing 
and how much we deviate from that that uh, intent by dedicating some resources to temporary emergency sheltering. Um, and it would be a helpful, appropriate conversation, I think, for us to have with you, the policymakers, um, soon about that. One of the things we've done recently, and we've mentioned it repeatedly in recent months, is we've done some things that only six months ago were not intended to be done. We put up an additional Swift Haven site with Homes Now. The port offered a site on Cornwall and the city and the county offered resources to help that. And there's the prospect that that's going to go forward, may go forward. Um, you council authorized and we blessed an RFQ for Lehigh and Homes Now. These are net additive uh, sheltering um, methods by finding a site in a tiny home. Um, and I suspect there are some people who have uh, long expertise in this area who think we need to be very careful about where we draw that line and that we not go too far down that road if it has the effect of uh, limiting resources for the other obligation, which we think has primacy and even greater importance, which is permanent housing. So, uh, at some point very soon, I think it would be appropriate council discussion on that very point. Where do we draw that line? And um, what are you inclined to bless as it relates to that? I've been doing it with some authority that I feel I have administratively, but I don't want to go too far down that road if it seems to be outside the bounds of uh, where the council's at generally as a matter of policy. Michael? Yeah, thanks, Seth. That's, I guess that's really a good question you asked. Where do we draw that line? As you indicate, you're enforcing rules and laws that the city council adopted. And in recent years, we've created a few more exceptions and tools in the administration's toolbox to allow emergency winter shelters, to allow tiny home encampments to be sponsored by any qualified nonprofit. Um, but you're still working within the rules that we've created, and we have still indicated where that line is drawn. And I'd be happy to talk about that. I guess what I saw in Camp 210, and maybe it's a little bit obviously simplistic, but I think there's enough truth to it, that we need to draw a distinction between the protesters whose intent was confrontation, whose intent was, if not violence, something that looks a lot like violence and plays well on TV, um, and then the campers themselves. I, I know I was told by several of you not to go down to uh, the uh, camp clearing, uh, that I would be a magnet for problems, and I was. I was a magnet for problems. I got yelled at. But in between being yelled at, I talked really nicely with some campers, and I witnessed for myself um, exactly the kind of pragmatic way they were dealing with their lives and finding solutions for themselves or trying to figure it out. So, I mean, I think there really is a valid distinction to be drawn between campers and protesters, and I think the protesters are still i still think they're getting in the way of the solution um me personally when you know where to draw that line seth i'm willing to you know bend even further than we've gone before i'm willing to rewrite the rules and give the administration a bit more leeway to set things up um but what I don't want to do is make it seem like more and more flexible, looser and looser rules on shelters is the, actually the best public policy, because it's not, right? Go to all the rest of our discussions. The solution to homelessness is housing, right? Housing tied with services. The solution is housing and services. And no, shelter doesn't count. So it's a necessary band-aid. But let me just say, Seth, you asked, where do you want to draw the line? Right now, we've drawn the line one place. Me personally, I'm willing to consider moving that line a little bit, giving you a little bit more freedom and flexibility, but not in a way which enables protests and violence and confrontation and unsafe situations where there's no security, there's no safety, there's no regard to health risks of, of a numerous sorts that disrupt and undermine the substantial effort that the public is asking us to make, to reach out with services and housing, to offer housing and then to tie it to services. And if the protesters are getting in the way of housing and services, 
they're part of the problem. <laughs> Hi everyone. And anything that you're able to share at this point regarding the next steps or what? Well, the only thing that I, I mean, we've, we've got the code that says no um, camping in, in public places. Um, we've taken a strong position as an administration about the requirement that there have to be some rules. We have to work with a state recognized not-for-profit organization with whom we engage with permits and ensuring that um, that uh, standards are met, et cetera. So we've been clear about that. The, the only thing contextually that I felt that is driving us sort of the deep rudder in the water and moving forward is uh, in, in this continuum of housing with uh, as it relates to the need for improved sheltering capacity has been the work of building additional tiny home encampments. Um, if council thinks that um, I've gone too far in that regard, we can step in and have a conversation about it. But to get to your point, Hannah, um, just the diligent work of increasing a range of sheltering options is one way to address the problem. It's the only, it's the only practical thing that um, seems available to me. Um, the problem is what I refer to as, uh, I've mentioned this to a number of you, is that what I've referred to as gap anxiety, the period, the anxiety that you all have between now and the pressure we're all feeling and hearing, and the time at which we have increased sheltering capacity online. To say nothing of the thing that causes a lot of angst and irritation from the longtime professionals in this industry who um, feel that we've uh, um, taken a large step in our duty by putting up base camp and additional capacity at the drop-in center. So just a range of viewpoints um, out there but to your, your question, uh, if we're going to enforce the laws against camping in public places, and if we're going to maintain a strong position about requiring that there be uh, um, state-recognized, formalized organizations with whom we in, enter into agreements for a, for a site, um, then um, that means that we do not authorize the Frank Jerry site. And the other day I said, you know, one of the calls for one of the groups was that we permanently ban sweeping um, temporary, no more sweeps on public property. Uh, they wanted a new policy created around that. I'm not possessed of authority to do that. I, it violates our municipal code. You all are. I don't know if you, um, and I'm not proposing you take that step, but I'm just saying as a matter of uh, course, as policymakers, I'm doing that which seems to be clearly within the bounds of what I'm permitted to do. And yeah, go ahead, Michael. What I guess I'm saying is that I, I am willing to consider modifying those rules, but only so far, right? As a, as a general rule, it's a bad idea to have set up residential encampments, homeless facilities, and parks as a general rule. But are there exigent circumstances when someone can propose a low impact use that's safe and secure and protects the residents and fills a need satisfies my gap anxiety. Yeah, maybe under some circumstances. I mean, we, we already you know have provisions where we can do things we normally aren't allowed to do in emergencies. But even in those cases where it's an emergency, it doesn't mean there's no rules. It just means we flex some of the rules that are less important and keep the ones that are important. Keep the ones that, for example, have to do with the safety of the residents. And you don't have that authority right now. And I'd be willing to explore ways of giving you more authority. But, you know, 
it's not a it's not a making all rules go away. It's just getting rid of the ones maybe you can get rid of sometimes for short term because you have to. Hannah. So I guess, and it's when you talk about our different roles, right? It, it may be muddying the waters a little bit, but what I, I guess what I'm, I'm struggling with is the, the, what I anticipate to be sort of this cat and mouse game, right? If we clear Jerry Field and then they move, the protesters move everybody to another location. And, you know, the time and energy that staff um, is spending on this crisis without um, serving the, the right, the unsheltered members who are there. At this point, I don't even know how many, right? How many people are we talking about? Are there just a bunch of empty tents? Are there tents occupied by protesters? Um, and so I guess my concern is that isn't objecting to the fact that Jerry Field is not an appropriate place and that the conditions there, you know, need to be dealt with. It's that what happens next? I mean, ideally, I see in my mind that there's a location identified to say, from here, you go to X location for an intake to figure out, you know, who you are, what your needs are, and if there's a, a placement um, for you, but in some way to, um, again, I guess what Michael was addressing of how do we separate out the political demonstration um, from the needs of individuals in our community who may be able to be served by base camp, but right now that's being, you know, there's an interference being run Right, between there. I mean, we heard today from Ann Deacon and from Erica Lautenbach and from Chief Simon and Director Johnson, I mean, about this sort of deliberate um, interference that's happening. And so I guess my concern is that if we clear, right, if Jerry Field is, is cleared per the code, like what happens next? I don't wanna be talking about this for another year. I mean, granted, maybe the staying power will run out, but you know, how do we, um, collectively work together in our capacities as policymakers and on the executive to um, to really identify a, a path forward that we can all be on the same page and move forward together. Well, I guess that was my reference to doing the only thing that ultimately has the effect of um, minimizing the problem that you're referring to, Hannah, which is, uh, putting up some additional tiny home encampments and there's effort afoot in that regard. I, I, what I'm hearing you say is what do we do in the immediate time between now and when we've got an increase? Um, you're not proposing, I don't think, that we have the lower parking lot of Frank Jerry Field be a... a site without any kind of rules or an operator or anything. No, you're not proposing that. So the status quo presumably is not acceptable to you, I would think. I guess the, I mean, the, the request is how is not leaving them there, but at the current site, what I'm hearing from um, service providers in the community is that they don't have, and people running, right, shelters, don't have access to the individuals who could be filling those beds. Um, and whether there's any role for the city or is that just, we have to let that play out and in time, you know, people will leave the encampment and they'll find, you know, their way back. Um, and so I guess that's my question. Is there anything in the short term that we can do to help reconnect um, those people? You know, we're not the, uh, the case workers. Um, you raise a good question. It's like, by what means can we uh, cause the social workers that have clients there feel safe and feel welcome to re-engage? And of course, that's a question of, of their sense of, of safety and their inclination. Um, is there a role for the city to help in that respect? Uh, probably, I mean, we can certainly, we can communicate with people and urge that that's a legitimate concern and it needs to get resolved because there needs to be, by some means, re-engagement between, um, the care providers and their and their clients. So um, 
that's probably some phone calls offline with folks, but your your concerns well taken. Lisa. Thank you. Um, I shared this in a, a letter and I, I've spoken with uh, two council members, kind of my hope. Um, I don't I don't support a no barrier. Um, shelter, but we need something in the interim. Um, I also agree with Council President Stone that if we go in and clean up um, the Jerry Field parking lot, um, they'll more than likely just organize and go someplace else. And I have no interest in facing people across the city. Um, but we need something in the interim. Um, that, next few months. And so I had asked why we couldn't consider setting up two or three site locations for 10 or less and that individuals, much like you can't camp or you can't use a park unless you have a um, application. Like if I wanna go use Harriet Spinell Park for an event, I have to work through the parks department to be able to reserve the space. I sign an agreement and it's a, it's a hold harmless, you know, city administration for my event. So why can't we come up with several sites where there's an intake process and it would have to go through the city because we don't have part to, you know, a partner, but you do an intake, you know who's coming in, and then it's also matched in with our service providers, where if it's a small enough encampment so that, you know, we paint off a 20 by 20 section so that we have the, the spreading that we need, it's small enough so that um, it's not a large encampment, but we have the ability for our social service and our partners to be able to go in and work with those individuals. Um, I know there's the question about liability for the city, but I really see no difference between us providing porta potties and garbage in front of City Hall. We provide services there. So in a way, even though it wasn't a sanctioned camp, we still took on a certain amount of liability by, by providing those services. But if we identify a couple of locations, maybe with um, our partners of the county, city, and park property to be able to just temporarily offer someplace for people to go with an intake so we know who's there. They can self-determine I want to live with next to these five people and be able to go in. We provide the dumpster, we provide the porta potty, but we have safe means for our service providers to get in there and start reworking with their um, clients. Just putting that out there, don't know if anybody would support it, but these are the type of conversations we need to have some time to say, how are we gonna do this in the short term interim? Because if we don't have those tiny homes until April, that's still a few months. So either one, we leave people in place until we can, you know, get them into some other kind of um, tiny home situation or they disperse. Um, but right now, Jerry Field, it doesn't look very sanitary. I, I, I haven't walked in because again, because of COVID, I'm still isolated, but I've tried to do observation as much as possible. It looks like there's a lot of possessions and material there, but without necessarily the dumpsters, without the sandy cans going in, I can't imagine that it's a very hygienic environment for anyone. So we need to come up with something. And um, so either leave them in place, um, which I don't think necessarily is the best option, or we come up with another temporary option that we can have some sense of service. And I don't wanna say control in the bad way, but some level of intake so we can get those partnerships reestablished that have been disconnected because of this protest. I agree with Councilman Berliloquist. It's not about the protesters. It's about the people who are houseless and what are we gonna do to take care of them? We keep saying that, you know, this is a county thing. It's a health department thing, you know, it's, but right now it truly is a Bellingham issue. There are people living within our community that they need services. And because of the protesting, they've been disconnected from that. And so we need to figure out a very, if it's creative, great. If it's direct, it's great. But I don't wanna wait three months 
to decide how are we going to help these individuals to get them reconnected. If we can't get into the protest site, because depending on what day and who's at the gate is whether or not they're going to let a service provider go in and meet with someone or tell them where to find them, that's not appropriate. So we need to figure out a way that we can dislodge some of those people, put them into a safe place. I know we have base camp. We've put a ton of money into that. But realistically, is that we can't hope that it gets so cold that they're so miserable they're going to give up and go in there because right now we know that they're not. A certain amount did. It looks like 50 people. It's increased, but we need to do something. And if our county partners and our health department is not in the position to do it, then the people who I'm looking at right now on screen, we need to figure it out. So those, that's, I'll get off my soapbox. But if we need to get a meeting, I don't care if it's my day job, I'll rearrange it. But we need to have some frank, open conversation and not dance around politics at this point. Dan? Uh, I'm gonna to try to be diplomatic here. Um, <clears throat> there's not a person on this call who has, um, as far as I can tell, has any medical background or any clinical background or is, or is a social worker um, or who has gone, who has an education in the background or has brings any uh, experience there. That is why the, the county health department is important because the city of Bellingham does not have a, 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 a doctor. We don't have a Greg Stearns. We don't have a person that can guide us on, um, on, um, on infectious disease and, and those types of things. And I think the, I, I feel like I'm, that we're sort of out of, while while this is a, a it's taking place in Bellingham, absolutely, I don't think it's a thing about you know who's responsible. I think it's like who can we how how can we get the best resources uh, to bear here. I'm I'm gravely concerned about the case manager who I who I talked with two weeks ago, who said that she had lost five, five of her clients at base camp. Who these people were in recovery. She was able to see them. I'm I'm sorry at uh, Camp Two Ten. Sorry, Camp Two Ten. When they were at base camp, she was able to, to to work with these folks, get them stabilized in some level of recovery. Those folks went to, to Camp 210, and she was denied access to them. How? And she was there to to, to administer a, a medical treatment to, to one of the clients, and she was denied access. So my concern is the well-being. I know we talk about liability, and I think that word gets bandied about um, without real, not, and not maybe in this group but in in social media for sure like it's a, a fear thing that government's afraid of getting sued or something i'm afraid of someone getting hurt i'm afraid of someone who was in recovery that's no longer in recovery recovery that's that's hurt that's further traumatizing a person who may want to have may want to get into housing probably wants to get into housing and and that that's my concern i want to be abundantly clear on that that this is the safety of the people that we're talking about this isn't about if we, we get sued all the time, whatever. That's that's we're probably going to executive session for some other lawsuit that, that we have today. <clears throat> so I'm concerned about people's health and well-being, and I'm not going to uh, band-aid together a solution. Uh, I do. I know there, there's a sense of urgency. I get that. We are policymakers. We had a, a thorough discussion this afternoon with a with an expert um, who provided us many reasons why. A bigger, like a, a big unsanctioned, ungoverned camp is probably not going to be the best for the, the health and safety. And we need to keep our eyes on the other, the long term solutions that have been mentioned multiple times in, during this the call today. And that is produce housing. It is not going to happen today or next week or even in a year from now. But that's the solution. That is the, absolutely the solution. That and services, and when we don't talk about that because that's too—it's too complex, or, too, or that's not what's talked about largely in social media. What happened to fourteen oh six dollars? Where are we going with fifteen ninety? Do, do those things mean anything to anybody? <clears throat> I want to focus in on creating permanent solutions. I know that we have a, a group of folks at Jerry Fields. We also have groups of folks, individuals that aren't a part of that, that are homeless, that are in the woods, that are in RVs on Cornwall or next to Hagen's on off of Meridian. What about them? Are they not included in this conversation? Do they not matter? They, they absolutely matter. They're important people in our community. I, their, their houseless status is, to me is, 
doesn't make them bad people. It means it means that they, they need housing. They need they need housing, and we need to keep focusing on that. And we and we yes, we do need to come up with with a short term so solution. We're a, we're a legislative body. We're like Congress for Bellingham. We're, we, are, we are not known for our swift, nimble movements. And we don't have the level of expertise on this call. We need that level of expertise from the county health department or the hospital or Peace Health or whatever private providers could give, give us that expertise. So I'm, this is super frustrating that a chronic problem of homelessness that we've had for decades has been condensed into an acute problem. That's what we have here. This, this, this issue has taken decades, it has evolved, devolved over decades, and here we are trying to come up with a solution that's a tomorrow solution on, on complex psychosocial human beings who are traumatized and having, are in the worst, probably worst parts of their lives right now. So I want to have some sensitivity towards, towards them. In, in whatever actions we take. So I'll, I'll stop now. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Holly. So I'm probably just going to echo a whole bunch of a lot of things that was, that were just said. Um, but, uh, it's nice to actually be able to talk to all of you about this. <laughs> um, so I, you know, I, I, I kind of going back to what Hannah was saying about we really need to focus on the people who are the most important here in this discussion, and that is those people who are staying in tents. And, um, you know, to what Dan was saying and to what um, Ann Deacon was saying earlier, one of the most distressing things about this whole situation for me is hearing those stories of people being disconnected from their service providers and their case managers and falling from recovery and not getting their prescribed medications and hearing the stories of, of the, you know, the, so it was not for trying, not for lack of trying. Um, and so I guess trying to figure out a way to, to, to make that connection again, um, to facilitate that co connection, I don't think that that is the job of council at all. Again, we don't have the expertise in that. We need, we need people who, who understand that situation much, much, much better than we do. Um, my wish would be that we help facilitate some kind of reconnection with folks if we can at all um that's that is one of the only avenues for solution that i'm seeing right now um is that if there are gatekeepers um that are gatekeeping due to misinformation or they've been misled or misinformed um and they they perhaps are or unaware um is there a way to facilitate enhanced communication and understanding? Um, there's been a lot of misinformation, a lot of people misinformed, and a lot of people taking actions on that misinformation. That has been another horrific part of, of watching this unfold. Uh, and it has, it has left us... to make progress. So we've gone way over. Sorry about that. Um, this conversation will continue. It will. Thank you, Mayor. Um, we have two sets of minutes that need to be approved. Um, so we have meeting minutes from the 11th and the 25th. I guess we would take up separately. Um, so the meeting minutes for committee meeting minutes for January 11th. I'll move approval. <clears throat> So we have a motion from Councilmember Hamill and a second by Councilmember Vargas. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Seeing none. Um, that passes unanimously. And then the second set of committee minutes from January 25th. Move approval. Second. We have a motion by Councilmember Huffman and a second by Councilmember Anderson. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor will say aye. 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 Any opposed? Seeing none, um, that passes unanimously as well. Actually, um, my apology, Deputy Clerk Oaks, um, Gene Knudsen, I know he's still connected to the call, but I don't believe that he's present. So if we could just make that 601 for each of those. That was my miscount. Um, thank you. And old and new business. <laughs> 
anything for with more homes in the Pacific Northwest. Okay, we'll have another old new business this evening if something comes up. Um, but at this point, we will adjourn to executive session. As I said, this afternoon, we have three items before us. Hopefully everyone received a notice that <clears throat> the order of those items has changed slightly, but potential litigation with Rafato for approximately 30 minutes. Potential litigation claim number 